So thank you for coming. And I am um, going to do. I'm going to tell you first about my experiences at um, Harvard Law School and in the second wave of feminism in the late 60s. And um, much of that is described in my book, Not One of the Boys Living Life as a Feminist, which um, was published by Knopf in 2000. Uh, unfortunately, it isn't here for sale, but it is for sale on the internet. Um, the, the, um, after, after I talk about the first beginning of this, then I'm going to talk about where we are today. And I want to include in that um, both jarring statistics as well as images from the Women's March from all over the world. And then finally, I'm going to talk about where I think we should go from here. And obviously, I want feedback and questions and comments and everything at that point. Um, as I talk about in my book, uh, I was um, at Harvard Law School, and I was a class of 69. Exactly 50 years ago, um, I was in a constitutional law class ta taught by Paul Freund, who in those days was the most eminent constitutional law professor um, in the country. And his day of, uh, that made me into a radical feminist was when he made a joke out of the Gessert against Cleary case, which was a Supreme Court decision that upheld a, Mich a Michigan statute that prohibited women in Michigan from serving as barmaids unless their husbands or fathers were present in the bar at the time they were working. That made me so angry that even though I was terrified of speaking up in class uh, and had not done so in that class, I was in a rage and I stood up and I said whatever I had to say about why I disagreed with his statement about the opinion. Um, oh, thank you very much. I, okay. Is that okay now? I'm going to take off my, is it my coat or my jewels? Okay. Thank you. I didn't see, I saw something and I couldn't, you couldn't have a question. That's it. I don't almost need it. Maybe a, even against this. It should have been. The black part up here? Yeah. Is that better? It's no. okay. Well, I hope. All right, better? Thank you. I didn't know that. Um, anyway, th after that class, I ran out in, in tears of rage. I was furious. Um, nobody had come to my defense. There were no visible women in the classroom at all because there were 32 of us out of a class of 565. And in that section, I couldn't see any other women. So I um, really, at that point, had my eyes opened about the law school, which at that time had something called Lincoln's Inn, which didn't allow any, I don't know if Lincoln's Inn still exists, but no women were allowed to join. No women were allowed to play on the squash courts at Hemingway. Um, they had ladies' day in most of the classes, and property, it was the one day of the year when we were asked uh, who owns an engagement ring if an engagement is broken. In criminal law, it was how much penetration constitutes rape. And it went on like that. Um, the interview process was extremely painful because one firm, and I'm talking about major New York firms, told me that they had already hired their one woman for the year. In fact, one firm told me that they didn't hire women at all. And that was not, um, at that moment in time, considered illegal. It turns out there was such a thing as Title VII, but I'm getting to that. So, um, well, I'll say it now. Title VII, as you may remember, was passed in the 60s, and it was... Um, a joke to include sex discrimination in it because the southern racists who were supporting it thought that was a way of making the law not get passed and therefore um, blacks would be deprived of, of uh, equal rights in employment because there wouldn't be any um, uh, ability. To, I mean, they, they didn't care that women were excluded and the issue was how are we going to prevent employment discrimination. So anyway, moving right along through um, Oh, and one other thing about the law school. There was a, in the stacks at the library, uh, I was down there with a friend of mine, Kimba Wood, who, was, who is now a, a district judge of the Southern District of New York. Um, there was a big sign painted into the frosted glass that said faculty. We realized it was a bathroom, and of course there were no women faculty members at Harvard at all, so faculty kind of worked for a men's bathroom, faculty men's bathroom. Um, I became national vice president of legislation for now, um, in 19, late 69, 70, and my um, task was to 
organized the pro-testimony for the Equal Rights Amendment. I had met Birch by, who was the chair of the Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Constitutional Amendments earlier. And uh, there, in that capacity, I met a lot of people like Gloria Steinem, who became friends as well as uh, colleagues in the women's movement. Um, the uh, experience of having to fight for ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment was amazing because the backlash, Phyllis Schlafly started in with her ego forum and um, telling us that the Equal Rights Amendment would cause divorce. It would allow people to get divorced, which of course makes no sense at all. So anyway, um, that, the amendment passed out of Congress in 1971. But unfortunately, by 78, we were still missing one state, and that was never ratified. Um, I'll get back to that, but that's a different constitutional law subject. Um, so the women's movement was gaining, gaining a head of steam in 1972, and all of this is described in this book. But um, after I helped Gloria Steinem start Ms. Magazine in basically 72, um, three weeks later, I got a call from the ACLU asking me if I would be interested in running the Women's Rights Project of the American Civil Liberties Union that Professor Ruth Bader Ginsburg was committed to. And I didn't know her, and I didn't know what they were talking about, except that it sounded exciting. I told Gloria, because I was very upset, we were going to just start getting the magazine off the ground. And she said, look, there aren't any other feminist lawyers, so you should go and do that. And I did. Um, it was extremely um, exciting. I was. Um, it was right on the heels of the Reed v. Reed case in the Supreme Court, which uh, held that it was unconstitutional. This is the first case in, on sex discrimination in the Supreme Court. Um, it held that it was unconstitutional to favor fathers over mothers when it came to administering the estate of a decedent son. So that was the issue. There was no, quote, rational relationship, close quote, between the distinction in the statute and any legitimate state interest. So we were building a project based on that decision that was extremely exciting. Um, excuse me. I was very privileged to next work on the Frontiero against Richardson case, which was the major Supreme Court sex discrimination case. Um, that was a case of Sharon Frontiero was a uh, Air Force officer who wanted her husband to get equal benefits as wives for their husbands got, if you understand that, um, housing and medical benefits. Um, husbands had to be more than half dependent on their wives for support, but wives just had to be wives. And the Supreme Court, in a plurality opinion, held that there was, there was, it was a suspect classification, it being this gender discrimination, and um, they, of course, overturned the statute that gave husbands a preferred status over wives, I mean wives a preferred status over husbands. And uh, we were one vote short of getting the majority of the court to say that sex is a suspect classification. So we've been struggling with those standards, and I'm sure if you've had any constitutional law, you know what I'm talking about. Um, next up, uh, with the Women's Rights Project and in general with Supreme Court litigation was the Weisenfeld case, which granted widowers the same benefits, Social Security benefits, as Widows, um, Craig against Warren came next, and that was a case that held that um, it could not be, the men were entitled to the same higher standard, a higher percentage beer standard as women. There was no reason to have them have to have a, a higher percentage than women. Um, and that created an intermediate standard in sex discrimination cases. There has to be an important relationship. Um, Title IX was passed in 72, right around the same time, which I'm sure you all know required that institutions, educational institutions in particular, that got federal funding could not discriminate on the basis of gender. And that led to a whole bunch of confusion about did women have to have the same amount of money uh, in their sports as male, for example, football and basketball, et cetera. One interesting thing that happened in the, in the 70s was the, uh, Demo the Democratic National Committee decided to require that women and men have an equal participation in the uh, delegates to the national conventions, and so began, you probably haven't noticed it, but when you look at the convention, should you be so inclined, there is a 50-50 percentage um, women and men in the, um, in the delegations. The Republicans didn't do that. I don't know what they did, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I just want to say a query whether or not um, that idea of mandating a 50-50 relationship, women to men, would hold over in other walks of life beside the Democratic National Conventions. 
Um, moving to the 80s and 90s, um, 1986 sexual harassment was deemed to be sex, this is all by the Supreme Court, deemed to be sex discrimination. Um, 87, it's illegal to discriminate on the basis of pregnancy. Um, 91, I'm sure you remember Anita Hill against Clarence Thomas, not a Supreme Court decision, but nonetheless worthy of national attention. Um, 93, Harris against Forklift held that a work environment, hostile work environment is illegal. 93, the Family Medical Leave Act, FMLA, was passed. 94, the Violence Against Women Act was passed. And 96, the VMI case, which is one of my favorites, where Justice, now Justice Ginsburg wrote for the court that there has to be an exceedingly persuasive standard for any uh, discrimination on the basis of gender to exist. Um, in the statute, of course, I'm talking about things that have something to do with government action or we don't have a constitutional case. Um, also in the 90s, just to move where, where I'm getting in this discussion, um, Smith Barney was sued by 23 women charging rampant discrimination and harassment, um, and the case settled for $150 million with, 20, with 2,000 women joining in. So that's sort of where I'm leading with respect to what we should be doing, which is bringing lawsuits, even though I hate litigation myself. Um, on the other big feminist front was Roe v. Wade, uh, establishing a right to have an abortion in certain staggered ways, which I'm sure you know about. And um, while we're on that subject of reproductive freedom, I started a offshoot of the Women's Rights Project at the ACLU called Reproductive Freedom Rights Project, which um, included, for me personally, bringing two, three cases in the South against the state governments that um, propagated the notion that it was okay to sterilize young, u poor, usually black women um, for all kinds of reasons, including one that I had where they called her mentally defective. Um, you may remember the case of Buck v. Bell, where the court said that three generations of idiots are enough. So, um, imbeciles, I think. Yeah, she, three generations of imbeciles are enough. Uh, um, that, those, my, my cases were thrown out because the statutes of limitations had run, and they hadn't brought the cases, even though they did, some of them didn't even know what was going my, my favorite client went from North Carolina, brought me a piece of paper um, that said on it, um, uh, bilateral tubal ligation. She didn't know what it meant. I told her what it meant and told her she had been sterilized. Uh, she didn't know that and therefore query when that statute should have begun. Most advanced jurisdictions say on discovery, not on something that happening that you didn't know about. Um, the good news on this front is last year a $50,000 per person settlement was um, uh, developed and people were actually paid for the harm done to them. And there were some men and some white people, but mostly it was young, poor black women. Um, that's about the first 30 years, believe it or not, of the women's movement. Um, as you can see, the Supreme Court litigation just moved rapidly. And now, of course, it's much harder to have cases that are unique enough for the court to take, not to mention what the split on the court is. I have no idea. I don't want to think about that. I mean, I have an idea. Personally, I have three um, cases that I'm fond of. We can talk about later if you're interested. One is the um, a stunt woman suing um, the studios because, and the employer in particular, because a man was allowed to wear a wig and pretend he was a woman, and women in the stunt world are trying to get work, and if men act like women. There's also a painting down expression that has to do with white people painting their faces black so they can pretend to be uh, either African American or some other kind of um, diverse group, and it turns out that that also is now against the rules, and I don't know how it's gonna hold up in court, but I'm optimistic. Um, I have a case of a woman teamster who was very badly harassed, so they're women teamsters. And finally, the big case that I'm proud to say the ACLU has just come in to co-counsel with me is the case of female dock workers um, who get pregnant because they're in their 20s and 30s and they want to have children, and they uh, can't rack up enough hours to become members of the union, the ILWU, so they, because they work on massive ships and they're carrying loads of stuff all over uh, the docks and it's dangerous and the union and the Pacific Maritime Association, which is the other defendant, don't see their way clear to make either light duty or lighter duty for them the way they do for people who are actually injured on the job. So that's a big case and I'm optimistic about that. Just filed with the EEOC two weeks ago. Um, and but just on this, oh, and that also has to do with lactation. Women who are pumping breast milk aren't given a private safe space in which to do that, and 
Um, that's required by law. And uh, it's just they're either in bathrooms or in their cars, and the uh, law prohibits that. So there they are with that as a lawsuit. And the ACLU just told me the other day that they have a case of lactating pilots, which is in female pilots who are flying. I don't know how you have a private safe space. They're going to work that out. Um, OK, now I'm at my favorite part of this whole thing, if I can screw it up. Uh, will you help me start this? Yeah, oh, here, the clicker. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah I, I want to get up because I want to look see. Here we go. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is what I like because I didn't do this. I, I am privileged to have made the acquaintance of the women who put this Why I March book of images together. And um, they are, it's Getty images, and it came from all of the different um, states and countries that had the march on January 21st. So I'm going to see if I can do this. And we're going to go at my pace. And if we have to go back, we will. This is Washington, DC. Here we are. This is January 21st, the day after this horrid thing happened on January 20th. And, um, and there's people from everywhere, mostly women, but a lot of men, I'm very happy to say. Washington, DC, more Washington. And you can try to see the, the uh, posters get are creative, and they get even more creative as we go through this. Um, more Washington. As you know, a lot of people from all over the country went to Washington. M many of us stayed, like I did in, in, in Los Angeles, where there were 750,000 people. Washington claims to have that many. I think it's closer to 600,000. In any event, here we are still in Washington. More Washington, free Melania in the front. Um, OK, so I love the if I make my uterus a corporation. We all stop regulating. I love that. Um, OK, so now uh, she's great, too. She's sitting there on the street. Uh, I, I love this. Um, OK, and we have, um, I mean, I, people are just so creative. And it was just, there they were. I, I'm very excited. This I love, too. I just love it. Um, and uh, you know, I think it's exactly right. Uh, I'm going to get into the discussion of intersectional, but I, I want right now to show you all of this. And you can see the lots of different issues being raised. She's great. I just love that. It's so subtle. Um, OK, here we're still in Washington now. Um, Washington and all of this. And you can see that. Um, now, I have to say, I'm going to point this out to you, that I um, have a grandson who was sitting in the den and said, oh, grandma, there you are. I didn't even know he was looking at the pages, but that's the back of me. And Joanne, who is right here, is next to me and, uh, and the white shirt that actually says the right is wrong on the front. But anyway, there I am on the right side in Los Angeles. And there's something else screwed up here. I'm supposed to turn down the lights. Oh, oh, it's OK. You can see that, right? Sort of. OK. Is there? Yeah, if you, if you can, if it's not too much of a production. I just want them to be able to read some of these. They're so creative, and I don't want to slow it. Oh, you showed me how to do this. Uh, oh, there you go. OK. Just a little bit. OK? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right, so now we're moving on. There's New York is going to figure prominently, but here's New York on the left with the cops and the, and the bikes. Um, and the, one of my most favorite pictures in this whole thing is Boise, Idaho, in the middle on the right in the snow. Uh, and look at that crowd in Boise, Idaho. It's just amazing. Um, OK, here we are in the rain in Portland. People were not deterred by weather. Fight like a girl. Um, I'll show you more of Denver and all of the uh, Costa Rica is now coming up. And you're going to start seeing all places all over everywhere. And can you see OK? You can see this stuff. OK, great. Um, Columbia, South Carolina is also raising, or raining, raising, raining. Um, Chicago is proudly there. There we are. Los Angeles looks like an empty. Believe me, I love the baby. I just love that. OK, babies. And they're in Columbia, South Carolina, and then Toronto. Um, here we are in Denver with Indians and their movement, again, in our march, the Women's March. Boise again. And Portland. New York. Now we're beginning to see the throngs in New York on Park Avenue, and it's going to be all over everywhere. Uh, California is lumped together. There's a great sign of Ruth and um, that bottom right is, of course, Los Angeles. Um, there, there she is. All right, Houston. And uh, build bridges, not walls. I think those people are in wheelchairs or something. 
Yeah, is that great, the IKEA? I just love that. Um, and this is a very touching picture in, in Portland, Maine. All right, here we go with more of New York all over everywhere, everything. And much more of New York. I like that you're not angry, you're not paying attention. You're not really not, you know, Fairbanks, Alaska. I mean, geez, <laughs> whoa. I mean, they came out of the woodwork. Okay, um, Miami. I don't know where they are now, but there they are. Um, Amsterdam and London, and you'll see more of everywhere. Lima and Brazil, and, and Brasilia. Um, Chicago, my hometown. Germany, Pol Poland, oh my god. Yes, yeah, all on the 21st of January. I can't tell you what time zone anybody's in. Auckland, New Zealand, I mean, this is an example of time zones. I don't know. I don't know what's the day before. It might have, well, our next day, right? But, no, their next day. Oh, their next day, okay. When I went to New Zealand, it was the day before. Oh, cool. my, I called my mom, and it was one time the next day, but then time there. Okay, that's really cool. But I, uh, that's very cool. Were you in this march? Yeah, I was watching. All right. Um, Nairobi and Durban. I don't know what day it was in Africa, but wow. Um, I don't even know, Accra it must be in Africa, somewhere near these places. I don't know, but there they are. Uh, Cape Town and Nairobi again. All right, I love the seeds. I just love that, and I hadn't heard that. Mexico and everywhere. Paris, Paris gets very dramatic. It's with nasty Latinas in Paris, which is kind of cool, I don't know. Okay. Uh, Melbourne, Copenhagen, Amsterdam. London has a lot of people, as you'll see, and that, I mean, my God. And this is for our crazy situation. Okay. Bulgaria. Paris is wonderful. Barcelona and Dublin. Okay. Oslo and Paris again. I love this. Planet B. Okay, Lisbon, I mean, you can see, I mean, it's everywhere, all over every place. Lots of people in London and Paris. Uh, okay. I can't even pronounce um, But every place, there are all these cities. My America welcomes refugees in Barcelona, I love that, okay. Uh, London and Dublin. I'm not exactly sure who Rosa is, but I know she's on the right side of everything. Okay, Paris again, and Sofia, Bulgaria. I'm not sure they get, uh, I don't know if they have equality there of any kind, but there they are. Okay, Lisbon, Paris. Paris again, cool. Okay, Manchester, wow, and Muslims. Oslo, jammed. Paris, jammed. Paris likes Ruth, Shiro, and Krakow. Athens, more London, Prague, Dublin again, and Boston. Okay. Well, I like that a lot. Oh, wow. And um, this is cool. And Macau. Tel Aviv, which is very good that they're doing that. New Delhi and Taipa. I don't know where are these people. Are. Oh my God! Sydney and Auckland again. Now back in Sydney. Great signs. Cool in New York. <laughs> uh, Antarctica. This is so neat. Oh my God! And then watch this with these people on skis in whatever kind of weather, and we're back <clears throat> with Muslim signs all over everywhere in the world. Um, and finally, the last shot, which is seven continents, 82 countries, 5 million people, one movement. Exactly. So, now, if I leave this here, and then look, I can move it myself. I'm going to go back to my, my notes. Um, 
just so you don't get too excited about the progress we've made, um, I want you to hold the photos in mind while I read off some contemporary statistics. And these are numbers that I, um, I pulled out of the New York Times and the LA Times, the only two pa papers I have time to read uh, since June. Okay, So this is just headline stories in various papers. Um, <clears throat> well, this one in particular bears notice, which is women in the legal profession <clears throat> are 50.3% 50 of current law school graduates. Um, but only 35% of lawyers and law firms and the share of equity partnerships is 20% for women. And that has not changed in recent years. Uh, with respect to equal pay in general, while Trump has worked to eliminate the rule that aimed at equalizing pay, <clears throat> the gap between women and men persists with white women at 82% of white men's wages, Asians at 87%, these are Asian women, black women at 65% of white men's wages, and Latinas at 58% of white men's wages. Um, 2016, 17, excuse me, 7% of films were directed by women. 17% of episodes on broadcast cable and streaming networks were female directed, 3% minority women. Um, in a new USC study on the film industry using sophisticated software, 4,900 men versus 2,000 females were doing the talking. There were seven times as many male screenwriters and 12 times as many male directors. As for casting directors, there were two times as many men. But if female writers were involved, female representation in the story was 50% higher. Theater, of course, women are at a gross disadvantage as designers, directors, artistic directors, and producers. Women in tech um, under 25 years old earn 29% less than their male counterparts. Women of all ages receive lower salary offers for the same job at the same company 63% of the time. Women hold 11% of executive positions in Silicon Valley companies and own only 5% of tech startups. 7% of the partners at the top 100 venture capital firms are women. The rate of women quitting jobs was more than twice as high as the rate for men, and I suspect that's probably because it's not such a great place to be working. Google, you probably remember from the memo that that guy wrote <clears throat> stating that men have, quote, higher drive than women, as he pointed out that there are innate differences between men and women. Wow, that's brilliant. Google's overall workforce is 69% male. The tech staff is 80% male. Corporate leadership is 75% male. <clears throat> Excuse me. In science, two noted female scientists named Jones and Lundblad were at the Salk Institute, and they filed suit recently saying it's an old boys club, a, quote, culture where women are paid less, not promoted, and are denied opportunities. Another woman, Beverly Emerson, just joined in the suit. All are full professors whose science is lauded. Fortune 500, the percentage of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies that are women is just over 6%. In 2016, of 132 companies and 34,000 employees, women who negotiated for promotions were 30% more likely than men to be labeled intimidating, bossy, or aggressive. Half or more women who earn MBAs this year will drop out of full-time work for, out of the out of the full-time workforce within a decade. And again, I wonder if that could be because they're treated badly in that. Um, environment. Um, overlooked, however, are female-led firms that do better with an annualized return since 2009 of 25% versus 11% for the broader market. Um, corporate boards. Companies with at least one woman on the board outperform those with none by 26%. Having even one woman on the board reduces a firm's chances of bankruptcy by 20%. Republicans. Mitch McConnell, referring to the Republican Working Senators Group and the health care bill, declared, quote, everybody's at the table, close quote. But in fact, three women senators, Collins, Capito, and Murkowski, were not there. But it was fine with McConnell because he didn't care that there were no women there. Everybody was there. Um, attitudes about women. One million posts were mined by computer from an anonymous message board about women. And here are the words that were used to describe them. Hotter, lesbian, baby, sexism, tits, anal, marrying, feminazi, slut, hot, vagina, looks, pregnant and pregnancy, cute, merry, gorgeous, horny, crush, beautiful, secretary, cunt, shopping, date, sexy, dated, and prostitute. About men, there was no hostility with descriptive words like advisor, mathematician, pricing, textbook, and warden. Statues and parks. Only 8% of the publicly viewed statues are women. 
nine out of 411 national public parks are named after women. Women in city government. In New York, 12 of 51 in, on, city, on the city council. Chicago, 13 of 50 city council members. Houston, four out of 16. Philadelphia, six out of 17. Los Angeles, two out of 15. California has 482 cities. I just have this from the LA Times. Only 72 have a majority of women on their councils. Um, one exception is Blue Lake, California in Humboldt County, five hours north of San Francisco where there's an all-female city council. And one of those members said, women just know how to work together in a way that men probably don't. Understand. Uh, all right, so now on the, on the end of last part of this is what I just want to tell you about what I think the future holds, which is that there may be more lawsuits coming. There should be more lawsuits coming. But I think we need to focus more on the problem of why have women ceded so much to men? Why are we discriminated against still in almost every walk of life, every profession? Why does this happen? After the horror of Hillary's defeat and the election of Trump in the march, we acted together without definitions or boundaries, without an emphasis on the various issue, is, isms, or as one New York Times review put it, without a focus on identity politics, as that phrase is used to, today. To me, it's distracting. As for men, it's not very interesting, at least to me, to divine our differences with them. Rational men like the ones in the Women's March are on our side. We nailed almost all the issues before 2016. I was reading them off to you, other cases, um, when the election happened. And now I think we need to imbue the values um, that these issues represent and articulate values from which they stem. For example, issues that haven't been resolved that are key to a feminist agenda. Child care, 24-hour child care, addressing climate change, voting rights, an end to Citizens United, immigration reform, including DACA, Black Lives Matter, some of these may not be obvious women's issues, but they are essential to all our lives. We need to survive in a country with democratic ideals. Um, I just want to say that, it, just in closing this, that it, it helps me to think of feminism as an engine with wheels. Each wheel is made up of spokes, and I see those spokes as being the different causes that you saw depicted in these pictures, all of them from everywhere. And they come together as a wheel, in my opinion, and the, and the wheel is feminism, that whole thing with the different spokes. And I think it's, it's important that we note that everybody is either a woman or is in an intimate relationship with a woman, no matter who you are. You've had a mother, something. Um, not true of other isms. And that's why it kind of connects and, and binds things together. Um, we need to rid the world of faces, and we need to dump da to, to enforce and keep da DACA. We need to dump Trump. We want to note that Black Lives Matter, that we have a right to control our own bodies, a right to equal pay. These all work together, just as we all march together in those pictures. These folks really need each other. A recent op-ed in the New York Times, written by four religious leaders, advised us to pr protest as issues arise and not wait for a, a perfect moment. So a final challenge is that I, you all are either lawyers or you want to be lawyers or something. You are um, in the most uh, privileged position you could possibly be in at Harvard Law School. There's nothing better. And uh, who else but you and your classmates and colleagues is going to fight for this change? Um, when I, I, I mean, this is silly, but it's not really when you think about it. When I was at the ACLU, the most calls we got literally, bar none, were from women who wanted to keep their, quote, maiden names, close quote. Of course, I call them birth names. But um, they wanted to keep their maiden I said, then go back and use it. There's nothing requiring women to change their names. And it's stuff like that that I just feel you know, we have to be conscious of. Lawyers, yes, we serve clients. But the important thing is to take charge and make change in society. And if clients want us to help them do that, great. But I just feel like. You know, we are here, I mean, I was here 50 years ago, and here I am now still saying we need equality, we need to be able to insist on it. And um, there's no magic formula, there's nothing to wait for. I mean, I don't know what anybody's doing, except they're saying that we're waiting for it. Um, I, I just saw in the New York Times editorial on, as I was flying here from Los Angeles on Thursday, that um, women tend not to run for office, even though we bring lived experiences and crucial viewpoints, and that last thing is a quote. Uh, we have to run for office. We have to take control of this stuff. Um, 
I was on, also on the plane. We were flying here next to a man who uh, went to Harvard Law School and is working on a paper that says that Harvard Law School students should be spending more time on um, social uh, issues and public service. And I completely agree. And what I'm talking about, of course, is public service. So I, um, I just want you to know that I am issuing a mandate, which is just do it and pass bills and run for office and bring lawsuits and advance the leadership positions, there is nothing we're waiting for. Nothing's going to change. We just have to do it ourselves. On that note, I thank you again, and I want to take whatever comments, questions, et cetera. So thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Are there any other organizations that are uh, that you are a fan of that you think have been doing a great job? Well, on the on the gay and lesbian et cetera front, um, uh, uh, the human rights campaign has been doing a fantastic job. Obviously, the ACLU. I mean, when you when you look at all of the immigrant and the bans and the everything that Trump is trying to institute, um, they, the ACLU, as you said, is doing a fantastic job. I don't know of any national organizations. Planned Parenthood is getting into a lot of trouble with funding, and it's going to probably end up being private money soon. I don't know how we're going to work that out. I'm not, I'm not aware of too many others, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. You're right about indivisible. Um, so I mean, I'm just, I need to be educated about that. And can I make one quick pitch? Please, yes. I work here. Uh, <laughs> the, in fact, I bothered you a few years ago, um, and you gave me your book. I came out in um, Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. Fundraiser. So oh, yeah, 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 I remember. I'm always, you know, I've run so many. Companies sure. Guys. Um, but the Immigration and Human Rights Clinic here at the law school is going to be doing a lot of work help people deal with them. Well, DACA is the beginning of, I yeah. mean, yeah, and yes, I mean, there's, ugh, it's just amazing. So I just encourage everyone to, to check out the website because it's um, kind of exciting. What's the, what's the, which website? Uh, Harvard Immigration and Refugee Okay, Clinic. got it, yeah, cool. And they're based out of law school, and um, they just have so many students who weren't previously associated with the clinic showing up. To that's, the that's so great, absolutely, absolutely. And one thing I care about is that um, we have, I mean, it's easier, I, I think it's easier to figure out what to do about immigration problems because it's clear that we have to assert, um, whether, whether it's sanctuary cities or any other kinds of issues that arise on the periphery or even the center of that, um, it's easier for people to get their brains around that and go, in our case, to LAX and sit there on the floor with signs saying, we'll help you if you're having problems. So I just want, I mean, that's the first step, but I think there, as you know, there are others as well, and I want people to just get out there and do everything that they can. And there may not be time when you're a student as much as there otherwise would be, but you, have, you make time. It becomes expandable, I think. So that's what I have to say. I just, I mean, while we're talking about things, I just made a note to myself that um, when it comes to violence against women, I, I have a, um, I, I'm very much in favor of the laws that prohibit that. Um, but I also want people, I hear an awful lot of feminists going all the way back to my day um, talking about the problems of being attacked or otherwise um, violated. And I, sometimes I worry that too many feminists have been spending a lot of time on that state of being uh, victimized by the violence. And I think we need to move forward in addition to dealing with that. It's very important to move forward off the um, center, which is being violated and, and being victimized by horrible stuff, because that again is another easy, w easier way to um, address the issues. But we, I want to make change, and I don't know how we're going to do this if we don't start thinking about suing everybody. I mean, an example of a lawsuit that did not go anywhere, as you may remember, was Ellen Powell, who sued Kleiner Perkins for 
a lot of money um, because she felt discriminated against in her position as an employee. I don't know if she's a partner there, whatever she was, I think so. And um, they offered a seven-figure settlement. And then she insisted instead on going to trial, and she lost. So that was kind of a bad problem. Um, but it should not deter anybody else from going forward with lawsuits against who knows what. Um, there's a lot of vulnerability, as we know. And with Trump and his, quote, values, close quote, influencing um, society and getting people to stand up for everything wrong, um, we really need to be aggressive about it. Yeah. Well, what about the fact that the Trump administration or that Trump himself is going to be appointing hundreds, maybe even thousands of judges in the courts? And, I mean, I guess how does that affect bringing lawsuits? Well, it's horrible, and I hope I hope that there won't be approval of those. Um, hundreds if, if he's there. I hope he, I just hope he's impeached, you know, today. And, and I don't even know, it's this Saturday. Okay, but well, I mean, I, I, ju I just, we have to do everything we can to fight him. I, there's just nothing I can say that's positive other than that uh, if Gorsuch is an example of any of these people, it's a nightmare. And we have to go forward and fight it every single day. Yes. You mean on the right side, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's fantastic. It's extremely important because it sets the tone for the entire corporation, and, and those things are very powerful. And if they start um, seeing and hearing the leaders talk, it will counteract the um, sexual aggression that seems to have been prevalent with people like Roger Ailes and all of the other ones that just are, I think, um, being run out in disgrace. I may just be picking and choosing what I'm reading, but I, I'm feeling like an awful lot of women are standing up and um, bringing actions, certainly speaking out against um, sexual harassment. And it, it couldn't be more important. And that's what I mean. We just sit here and take it. I sat there. I mean, I'm furious at myself, at my young self, for sitting in these classrooms and letting the men dominate, letting the male professors put us down, make jokes out of us. Um, and if I hadn't had that experience with Gessert against Cleary and my absolute inability to control myself, um, I don't know. You know, I mean, I just, I just lost it that day. And we should be doing that. I, I'm just. Uh, I, I don't know why women, why we are so polite. I don't know why we take husbands' names. I took my husband's name, and he took my name, and then I, we both went back to our birth names. But still, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's just we're brainwashed, and that's what I think we have to get a hold of, is that women are just brainwashed into going along with this stuff, really, truly. Yes, Roger. I just want to make sure. Can you hear him? Can everybody hear? Okay, go ahead. I yeah. argued with her. You know, I asked right. her, hey, you know, yeah, she's really good and, and you know, she didn't have money issues, so she didn't you know, have to do that. So you know, she could have gotten the same thing you did with, uh, with our kids, which is get daycare. And, but she wanted to do that. Right. So, you know, is there, you know, what, what are your feelings about that? And I, I've heard that's kind of, you know, sort of a whole lot more prevalent. Well, I, I have a, a very strong view. I have a daughter who has an eight-year-old son and a five-year-old son, and she's in a community, Piedmont, California, which is extremely sort of mommy-oriented with all of this stuff going on with after-school programs and parents' days. And I mean, it's as though you have no other life but the activities around your, your children. Um, I don't like it. I think it's wrong. I, I even think that those families um, who are spending all of their time at children's games and activities and everything else and not having the children go with the parents but the other way around to whatever they're doing, is uh, the, I think it's a wrong focus for kids. I think everything becomes this little world that they're in. And, 
Yeah, of course, they are helicopter moms and sometimes dads, but I just think that women giving, I just don't agree that women should give up their careers at all, and I never have. Um, and I'm proud of the daughter that I have, and she seems to have survived my working full time. Um, one day before the six weeks after an emergency C-section, I was back at work, and yeah, we had a nanny, but that isn't the, that's not what's going on in her brain. We were coming home after work, and that's when her days were. In fact, the nanny kept her, had her take naps before we got home so we could spend more time with her at night. I mean, that, you can work it out if you just want to. I know there are more questions. Yes, please. I appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you. I really do. And, I, and that collage was very powerful. Uh, yeah. Um, you raised something about these. That I don't know why this happens. Or, you, know, you know, why do women, you know, um, give in to men? Um, the, uh, the, the, the messages we get when we were young, <clears throat> It was dramatically, for me anyway, shown in a musical called Respect, where the music of the late the 50s and the 60s uh, educated young girls and women that they were really, they re really needed to depend on the male for life to happen. I want to be Bobby's girl. Yeah. I don't know if you remember that song. Sure I do. There's a whole mess of, and this, this, I went to this, this musical, thank you. My wife appreciated that. There was like five guys there. It was extremely educating in the sense of the messages that we get when we're younger, both male and female. Now, I've never seen that musical taken any further. Or like, what are the messages that young girls or, or young women are getting in today's culture right. that results in this disproportion? And what are the messages that the men are getting you know, um, and I'm just wondering if um, this, this is a, there's a place there for. I don't think education is all the really the reason. Uh, the, the suing will do it much quicker than education, right. as it does in so many other areas. But there's still a, there's still a culture that's providing all these messages to young people and the women and the old people too. You know that. Um, maybe need to be addressed as well. I agree with you completely. And, and I just, I think women just have to say no. I, I, I agree that, that there are messages. Um, we have a, our now eight-year-old grandson was talking yeah. with us and he said something like, women can't be, you know, this is a very feminist mother, women can't be president. And we challenged him and he said, well, there haven't been, a, he knows every president, he's memorized it from the time he was three. I, you know, if there have never been any women presidents, it's not going to be obvious to children that women can be president. But it's a silly example, but that's uh, maybe not so silly. But that's exactly what um, the culture is is allowing. And I don't know what to do other than to ask people to stop respecting that. Hollywood, music. Hollywood, absolutely. I mean, I mean, like when Wonder Woman came out, people might want to see it, <laughs> which you know. Spider Man. Man, you know, the savior of the world. He was a woman saving the world. So, you know, we need more of that. And that's why this arts has been interesting, too. When, you know, women. You know, I'm a, I'm a member of the Writers Guild, and uh, it's the Hollywood and Screenwriters Guild. And we're a small percentage of, of women that are members. And if we're not writing this stuff, then it's not our experience and we don't get the same. And I'm in the music business too. And, uh, of course, we did have Barbie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. That's what I was going to say. But you just hit so many nerve points when you're talking. <laughs> I just wanted to add that, you know, when I was growing up, maybe just a little bit younger, but it was always Helen Reddy, Jimmy Moore, yeah. it was Carol King, it was, you know, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, the different yeah. tones. Aretha. And, you know, we were told that you could have it all. You could do it, and you could buy it, and they could, and you could go to work, and you could, you know, all this stuff. And and I think that's had huge propensity for, for, for equalizing, if you will, or to try to create some balance. 
but I felt out of balance. Yeah. And because when I went to work, then it was a different, another whole old boy network. So it was a shift in paradigm that never quite shifted. And now, maybe, maybe I'm just an optimist now, it's like, maybe that lessons learned brings us to the point of recognizing that it is not just passion and music that drive our energy, but rather hit it where they can, where the longer, the other side can feel it, which is in the pocket, you know, of going after um, the, the truth of the right, situation, right, right, right. Try, trying yeah. to move it forward in a constructive, using the tools and the institutions that are so well founded versus having it be almost like slapstick. Or, mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I'm reminded when you said that of, um, I don't know if you remember the Gorilla Girls who were um, artists m m made up in, in costume and to be gorillas, monkey gorillas, they're not monkeys, they're apes. And they were making posters and plastering them all over walls and public places in New York and probably in LA too, um, noting how few women artists are shown at the Metropolitan or shown wherever they're being shown. And they, they did it in an extremely creative and angry, but in a positive and constructive angry way to show how few women were in all of these different uh, aspects. And I think it's, it's important to call attention to it. I'm, I'm just struck by how nice women are about taking um, this craziness and, and allowing ourselves to be dominated by men when there is absolutely no reason for it and at all, in, in my opinion. None. Zero. If anybody wants to argue with me, yes, please. <laughs> but one of the uh, worries that I have is that there's a big sort of preaching to the choir yeah. method of this program going on. I mean, all of these pictures you showed for that women's march were all in major metropolitan areas, which are highly educated democratic mechas. Well, not all of them. There were some places I've never heard Boise. of. <laughs> now, Boise is. <laughs> but how, in, in those states, those are. We're from Grand Rapids, Michigan, mm -hmm. which was definitely a blue county in the red state. It actually all went for Trump, the county we lived in. <clears throat> but how do you get this message to a more rural Republican area? Because it's easy for it to be spread and to be believed in in these democratic factors and how you get it out to the people to change their minds. Well, my daughter, I've been referring to her, it, it believes, because she was as undone by this election as I was, that um, people like her should go and into those communities and sit down in coffee shops and restaurants and bars and wherever and talk to them. Because it's on a one, almost on a one-on-one -on -one basis, one-to-one -one basis, that they are getting the message that we are decent people and they should be um, talking with us, not ignoring us. So I completely understand where you're coming from. And I, and I think, again, I mean, Joanne's point about um, the media and movies and television is crucially important because our biggest export is uh, entertainment. And we are putting out this garbage. I, I made a movie called Navy Seal, so I shouldn't talk in 1990. Um, but I did that in order to get my foot in the door so I could make movies about women. And we're still trying to do that, which is extremely difficult. We can't get people to even be interested in the subject of women getting the vote in 1920, and we're working on that. So I understand. And that's the pocketbook, you know, saying we don't want to spend money on your project. We'll spend it on more of the Batman movies or whatever they are. Um, you're right, but I, it's it's just you, you just have to do it. I mean, if you have relatives in Grand Rapids, you see Grand Rapids, yeah, Grand Rapids. I, it's just I mean, you've got a bunch of people from Michigan here that can really. Uh, but I, I mean, it, you have to talk to them and argue with them. And I don't agree if we should be quiet around our Republican relatives and not raise the subject. I just get crazy with silence because that respects it. The silence just respects their right to be who they are and have their opinions, and they don't have a right to have some of the opinions that they have. They're dangerous and they're hostile. So. Sorry? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
and I, I, it's like he's not happy. Right, they aren't happy, they're angry. I mean, Trump's face goes down, like the, you know, and his, so does Ivanka's, and I mean, they all look miserably unhappy uh, and angry. So I, I think that we just have to persist in showing that we aren't like that. And I don't know, other than arguing with them, because I don't have any other tools. I mean, I don't have weapons of war to go. I, if I did, I probably would use them with some of these people. I, I can't, yes, please. I was wondering what you think, um, to your question, about there's some websites, I mean, I'm thinking specifically of Swim Labs, that target races where you can contribute. And I've really been looking at female candidates. Yeah. And I'm a, I live in Cambridge, so yeah. I'm a Democrat. But you know, I've even looked at moderate Republican female candidates just as a to send my little bit of money to, just as a way to get women's issues discussed mm -hmm. um, on a local level. So that might be. A, what do you think? Is that like a viable way? Talking to, did you say Republicans or was I hearing? Moderate Republicans. Moderate Republicans. I don't know if there is such a thing. Are you sure they? In some cases, I mean, I mean. There used to be. 99% of my funds go to Democrats. Oh, I'm sure, of course. Um, but just as far as supporting women candidates nationally, I think that. that well, Emily's that. list has been around for a long time. And, and in my day, there were moderate Republicans who were actually for choice. And um, I don't know if they exist anymore because I'm not sure that they would subscribe to anything else Republican. I mean, you know, the, it, but now that the, the dust has settled and Trump's true character seems to have come out, along with the people who defend him, I think it's easier to see who they are than when we had all of this, you know, let's be nice to them. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to sound like I'm just an awful hater, but I tend to really get crazy with with anybody who calls him or herself a Republican these days. I mean, I just, I just, I don't get what the, what the justification for it is. Yeah, my mom begs me not to ruin Easter. <laughs> I ruined Easter. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that. And I think you have to keep on ruining Easters. I mean, I don't know what else you can do. Or Christmas or whatever it is. It's just, you know, I, I don't know. So if anybody else has a thought, yes, please. Well, you, you just cheered me up if you think it's going to stay the same because I'm worried, you know, I'm worried about Justice Kennedy. Um, my friend Justice Ginsburg is determined and will stay on the court until the day she dies, I, unless she loses her senses. But she, she is not going anywhere. I mean, she's not well and she's bent over and she, I don't mean she's sick, I just mean she's been through a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so, so, but I'm just saying that uh, if we, yeah, I, I, Gorsuch is just a disaster, and I think, however, that people are forgetting that Justice Kennedy is still there, and he has been the fifth vote um, for uh, almost all kinds of for everything. Certainly, marriage equality um, and everything having to do in gay and lesbian rights, or any personal liberty issues. And, I mean, Justice Ginsburg was was pleased to tell us that she was able to sign on wholeheartedly to his Obergefell decision because she, he included a page on equal protection. Her whole thing is let's treat equal protection as paramount and pers all this personal liberty and everything else is much mushier and very, very important. And is there a, you know, an inalienable right to marry, that kind of thing. She's more interested in the, in the equal protection arguments. But Kennedy is still there. And if we can get rid of this monster, I don't know about Pence. I mean, I, the whole thing is just a nightmare. I agree with you. So 12, I don't know where you got the 12 years that things are going to stay the same. I mean, that. Well, I'm praying for a good person to be able to get to the next election and get a Democratic president. That's true. I. Well, 12 years? Four years. Well, four years, but you still have the same balance. Even if you get a Democratic president. Well, that's right. No, I understand that. I know. But if we don't, it's a mess. Listen, I don't. Uh, all I can say is that, again, it's a matter of lower courts um, getting appointments to the bench that would allow us to at least keep the balance that we have. And I mean, the Supreme Court is obviously, a, but it's a very rarefied environment. And I, th I think we just have to keep on with, with lower court decisions and the lawsuits that I'm asking everybody to bring to sue everything, because they're going to have a lot of trouble defending a, a racist or sexist or any other kind of, of uh, issue that they're being accused of. 
it's just, they, they can't defend it under the present case law. So, uh, you know. So I guess I, mean, I have to be, where is my mentor here? I think I have to be just disciplined and say that I thank you very much for coming. And I'll be around. Also, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to, the, to the tent. Oh, I have to say this. I did not, wherever this book is, I did not have anything to do with the book other than calling the editors and asking permission to show pictures from it. So if you have a minute and would like to get a copy of the book, it's at the book tent where I'm going after this. And it's a wonderful book that I, I wish I, I could say I had anything to do with, but I don't. It's Getty Images, and it's the uh, editors of... Um, yeah, they go to the the people that have to do with the march. Um, so it's Abrams. It's Abrams. It's, yeah, thank you for doing that. I think it's a great book. So anyway, again, thank you very much for being here. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.